The west coast of the United States is home to some of the largest and most impressive stratovolcanoes in the world. Due to the movement and the collision of the North America and Juan de Fuca plates underneath the Earth's upper mantle. And throughout time, as these volcanoes have risen and collapsed, they have formed a line of prominent jagged peaks stretching all the way from modern day BC to Northern California. This array of peaks, you know, has attracted mountaineers from around the world. People hoping to experience their natural beauty, the unforgiving conditions, especially Mount Rainier. Ever since the mid 1800s, it has attracted thousands of mountaineers hoping to reach its snowy summit people spend months just trying to climb Rainier alone. The unpredictable weather, the technical challenges, and the really the steep slopes, they require a high level of mental and physical strength. And you know, when you've grown up in the Seattle area, it's impossible not to think about all these beautiful peaks and not feel the urge to climb them. After three years of climbing together, a group of friends and I, we decided that we wanted to spend 30 days in one summer climbing the 12 most iconic volcanoes in the Cascade Range. When I first heard about the trip, I think I just like texted Daniel asking him, I was like, hey, we should, we should climb something this summer. Like, I don't know what I suggested, but we always usually climb stuff. So I was thinking of what we'd climb. And he all of a sudden tells me, I have this crazy plan to climb 12 Cascade Volcanoes. And I'm like, whoa, okay. And then I'm like, well, I mean, I better be involved because I was, I mean, that sounds like a dream come true to me. Everything felt really different as soon as the trip started. It just felt really weird because I came from just sitting at home every day to all of a sudden getting in my car and leaving for a month, which I'd never really done before. up a little bit here, past all this stuff. See you guys in Darrington. Okay, so this is the first day of our trip. Um, this was, we hiked up to White Pass, and this is the approach to Glacier Peak. So it started out with, I don't know exactly, maybe five miles or something, but it wasn't too far and it was pretty flat. And so we did that. We had heavy packs, so it was a little difficult, but it really wasn't too bad. And all of the elevation gain of that day was in the last mile and a half or so. We got to the bottom of that, took a long break, and then we started climbing, which it was incredibly hot out. We had very heavy packs and we were climbing some moderately steep trail. I think the biggest problem for me at that point was just that the pack was very heavy and I hadn't done any pack training. I was actually in Sweden before the trip, so I didn't get much of a chance to do that. And so my back hurt a ton and we basically just passed out. We threw our stuff down, we were just exhausted. And then we put up the tents and tried to make a meal and the stove just didn't work. And we were just like, oh no. Okay, so here's what happened. Um, what we did is we took apart the stove twice and then the second time we rigged the water pump to the nozzle for the stove and then we used water to flush out the entire tube. The problem was there was an obstruction in the tube and none of the fuel could get through. And so now we have a working stove. It, I mean, it needs a climbing helmet. This is now an integral component of <laughs> cooking operation, but I think we're good. How do you feel about mini bears? Mini bears? They're pretty cute. Mini bears, yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're kind of like little, little bears. <laughs> they're pretty small. <laughs> <laughs>
they dig pretty big, big holes. They're pretty funny. They have these huge dirt holes everywhere along the trails, and you just see the like marmots pop their head out, and they'll just run away. Or like the two of them will be like attacking each other or mating. I don't know. with a pesto filler. Right now we got lots of tortellini in here. And a pesto sauce. Oh, there's no tortellini in there. Oh! <laughs> so on the third day on Glacier Peak, that was the day we were going for the summit, uh, we started at about 7,200 feet at a place called Glacier Gap. And basically we were going with light packs and going up about 3,500 feet up to the summit. Summit day was tough. We woke up at about three in the morning and then, you know, we took a couple breaks here and there, you know, um, to explore crevasses and do other fun stuff along the way. But we didn't get back to camp until about 9 p.m. or so. And that was a long day. We were all really tired. What'd you say? We go over that lip and then I think we're on a different glacier. Looks like it. I can see some crack. Hey Daniel, how's it going? I'm good, just cleaning up some spaghetti. Rope troubles. Where are we, Daniel? We are at 10,169 feet, something like that, right below the summit of Glacier Peak. Hi Logan. Let's do a, a kiwi coral. What are you looking for, Logan? I saw a wallet. I you lost him? <laughs> you lost both? Yeah, dude. Well, there's dead. a lot of shit back here. Dude, how the fuck? Look at all that. <laughs> okay, like, actually, though. No. Where the fuck are you? We're at the lunch counter of Mount Adams right now. It's an absolutely beautiful day, and the views are absolutely beautiful. We can see Mount Hood back there, and Mount St. Helens over there. Um, today was much easier than any of the other days of the trip before, and we were, I guess, kind of surprised by that. But it's really nice because I was worried about, um, you know, getting sore after Glacier, and I was kind of worried that every, um, every peak would get harder and harder as we went but today was pretty easy, so I'm feeling really good right now. I think the, the bro game would do that. Gotcha, gotcha! The big hiney. Hey Kyle, how's it going? Great, how's it going, Zeus? We're just chilling up here. I know, so Look, nice here comes you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sweet. Oh, Kyle's so nice this is up such here. a nice campsite. Right? I know. Dude, Kyle, we're gonna, we're gonna try a slightly alternate route up kind of to the left. Why do you want to go up that route? Because, because it looks better. Be, there's gonna be hundreds of people. Okay. Tomorrow. 
But we should definitely go down with the say though. It's yeah. So fun, yeah, I agree. Yeah. What's the plan for today? Hmm? What's the plan for today? I'm gonna summit my abs. How are you feeling? A little tired, but. Yeah, I'm pretty tired. Pretty good. Ooh, very icy. Yeah. Very icy. A little icy there. cheese in it it's a uh, kind of oh you can open. see that's quite ripped open so i don't i don't know who i think an animal <laughs> mini bears got your cheese something took it it looks kind of savagely ripped open here All the campgrounds around Mount Hood are like $28, which yeah. is ridiculous. You don't need to pay that much for a campground. And we knew that we were only going to be sleeping there for about like, what, three, four yeah. hours. We decided, hey, let's just sleep in the parking lot, which turned out to actually work pretty badly. Chris, who sleeps like a rock, probably got like seven hours of sleep or something. I don't know. It was ridiculous. All right, Logan, what are you eating? Well, see, when you're living out of your car for a month, you end up being really weird stuff. So I got, here I got a corn tortilla, you know, Mexican cuisine. And I have some strawberry jam. I have some peanut butter. I also put some wheat thins. Oh, in. let's get a shot of those wheat thins. Check let's out. see them. Wheat thins, but they're, oh, okay. they're covered in jam. Very nice. They're still pretty good. And you see, yeah. this is a combination you never use unless you're living in your car. Yeah. yeah it's pretty good. I was kind of worried about Hood going into it just because, yeah, I mean, it has a pretty big reputation. There's a yeah. lot of accidents on the People route that we're taking on Hood. Lot. Even though, yeah. I mean, we were just taking the standard route on Hood, it's not too technically difficult. It is pretty steep. I think we left the cars at around midnight. You look cold, though, again? Yeah, I'm a little cold in the car. How's it going? Hey. All right. You ready? Yeah, we're going to go. And then we ran into this guy up on the approach, and it looked like, I think he was looking for some other people to climb with. His yeah. name was Tom. He was a pretty chill guy. Yeah, Tom was really cool. Um, so we ended up just climbing the whole day with Tom, and we, it actually worked out pretty great because he knew a lot more about the approach than we did. Yeah. So we didn't get lost, which was fantastic. Going into Jefferson, we knew that it was going to be quite difficult. Yeah. And we were honestly quite exhausted. We got to camp very late the night before because laundry took a very long time the previous day. <laughs> and we knew we had to wake up early, but we were not really feeling a 3 a.m. Alpine start. So I think we woke up at 5.30 or something. So Jefferson, I honestly, I kind of woke up and I was just like, oh, we're not making it this morning. So that wasn't a very good start to the morning, <laughs> but we eventually got on the trail and started moving. Once we hit the trail though, we had uh, some more problems. 
there's no real good climber's trail on Jefferson, so we couldn't find the trail to start out with. We just knew the direction we needed to go, and we knew about where we needed to cross the ridge. What do you think, man? It's pretty difficult. Pretty choss, huh? I don't huh? really know where we're going. Yeah. The route is pretty shitty. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We don't have any more instructions other than climb up to the ridge at 8,000 feet, so that's what we're trying to do, but this doesn't look too good. I think the worst part of the approach was the rocks. There was so many just little loose rocks that were really hard to walk on and it was kind of tough. Yeah, we were climbing yeah. up to the ridge and there was a riverbed, I mean, with, with a river in it, it wasn't, it wasn't dried up with yeah. rocks in it. And it turned out the best way, the, the easiest path was actually jumping from, basically jumping from rock to rock in the river because if you went up either side, it was just, it was, it was scree, incredibly chossy, and every step you took, you just slide. Yeah. There were rocks dropping everywhere, and we didn't want to get hurt. So we eventually just stayed on the riverbed and went all the way up. So we basically were getting even more and more discouraged. Um, we were trying to follow the <coughs> GPS, but we, it was, we were getting really mixed signals. And eventually what happened is we were just walking on snow for a while, and suddenly we just passed a crevasse and we're like okay we're finally on the glacier now because that's where we were supposed to go to we are 800 feet below where we thought we were going to hit the glacier or something weird like that but we were like okay we'll just put on our glacier gear and start traveling now yeah and from there it got a lot easier because it was just a nice straight shot along the glacier until we got to another ridge that's when it got really challenging it was really really steep and it was all rocks and scree. And most of the scree was pretty loose, and we had a lot of rock fall danger, which is just pretty bad. Honestly, the whole team was getting pretty frustrated at this point. Just yeah, that was tiring. Was difficult. The problem was that we couldn't quite make the summit traverse. Before we can get to the summit, you have to traverse this really steep slope, and that slope was covered in snow, and that snow, at this point of day, was all slush. And the snow is steep enough that we needed to protect it somehow, because if we slipped and fell there, you'd be falling down 1,000, 2,000 feet and you'd most likely die. So we needed to put pickets in to protect ourselves, to keep ourselves roped in, but those pickets couldn't hold in the slush because there wasn't enough solid snow for them to grip into. We were, I guess, kind of prepared to not make it. And to be honest, I was quite proud of myself and all of us for making it to that point. We were very, very relieved when we got to camp and immediately basically jumped into the lake to, to clean ourselves off and cool down. So on the trip, we basically lived out of our cars for a month, and I actually really enjoyed it. But there's a few reasons why you do this. 
Well, actually, it's more like you kind of have to, and it's kind of a classic climber thing to live out of your car. You're mobile, you can be anywhere, you can basically be near the mountain or near whatever your climbing destination is, not necessarily at it, but at the closest road, and you can have all your stuff there, and you don't pay for hotels, and you can kind of throw up a tent anywhere if you're daring enough. We Sometimes we're trying to find campgrounds, but sometimes we just, we ended up just putting it in kind of parking lots sometimes. We really always want a really minimalist campsite. Like honestly, all we need is a patch of dirt. But every time we try to look up campgrounds online, we get all these campgrounds and we go to all of them. They're all like $28. You know, they have their own parking lot, their own bench, they're like maintained. One apparently even had Wi-Fi. And so first of all, we don't want to pay all the money. And second of all, we don't need that. Yeah, we don't need it. So we found this excellent cow camp pretty close to the pretty close to North and Middle Sister. This is the second night we stayed here. And basically, it's just kind of a cleared-ish, like half cleared out forest area with a bunch of dirt. We just threw up, thrown up our tent somewhere. It was pudding milk. We need vegetable oil. We don't vegetable oil. Yo, Chris, do we have vegetable oil? Um, no. Oh, whatever. Oh, do we need it? We'll just do one and one third cup water instead of one third cup vegetable oil. I mean, we could just squish some vegetables. Why did we eat? I think. So there's a cake right here? Yeah. Woo! Really nice cake. There we go. Uh, so we just finished Middle Sister today, and we had quite an interesting experience happen at the top. So we got up there. We'd only been at the top for maybe two or three minutes. We'd just broken out the water, got some trail mix, and then my fleece jacket started buzzing. I thought it was a bug at first. But then Daniel's hair started to stand on end, and so did Zeos's, and our ice axes started to buzz, and we could tell that it was some, some static electricity going on from the clouds. So that was terrifying. We thought yeah. we were going to get struck <laughs> by lightning. My axe is still going. Just turn the camera on. I did. I'm filming. Don't put it in. Okay. Yeah. Yo, my ticket is still buzzing. Woo -hoo. Let's go. <laughs> oh fucking hell. Oh shit. Whew. It started pouring. And the weird thing was the weather was it was almost too nice before the um, 
before things started buzzing and acting kind of strangely, it was there was no wind and it was really warm up there. And it was cloudy but really warm. So it was kind of suspicious for a 10,000 foot peak. I love my sunglasses, but they were a pretty, a pretty bad pair of sunglasses, and I'm not too concerned about it. More concerned about the littering than the losing the sunglasses. But someone's probably going to mm -hmm. get up there, find some sunglasses, and be like, "Wow, someone is so irresponsible to put their <laughs> sunglasses up there." In reality, I, I basically left them out there <laughs> because I ran away. This whole trip, I've really wanted to get some great shots from inside crevasses. So we went up, um, I want to say to about 8,000, 8,500 feet on the Hayden Glacier, and we found this just beautiful crevasse. Um, it was probably 60 feet deep down to a blockage on the inside. Okay, yeah, yeah it, was it was pretty was wide. Extremely wide. So we set up two really bomber anchors. Logan went down, he went, I think he went probably like 40 feet down or so to a little shelf. Um, but then he went back up and then Chris went down, he went a little lower and he told me about like there was some sort of lake down there or something. There's a ton of water. Oh, there's a fucking lake down here. So I got really excited, you know, I grabbed my camera, put on the, the you know, special Your lens camera, and everything. camera, which isn't waterproof. <laughs> yeah, which is not waterproof, by the way. I did, we have a waterproof camera, but I didn't get the waterproof one. Daniel had it. Yeah. So I went down there, and I kind of, I went to this ledge, and I saw a bunch of water running down, and I was like, you know, it'll probably be fine. I can check it out. And so then I lowered myself down to the, oh, this, this ledge right below it, and by that time, there was just water pouring all over me. Oh, Basically, yeah. like, the little stream was just trickling right down my head, and I could see below, like, what Chris was talking about. <laughs> Turn the crevasse. Being rained on. Oh. Oh. I was kind of freaked out just because I was being like basically pummeled with water, and I was kind of worried about the camera. And I was trying to get footage, but at the same oh, time, shit. you know, keep it alive. I've never been so deep in a crevasse, and I've never been, you know, basically in a rainstorm in a crevasse. I guess. <laughs> Pretty cool, but very wet. Let's say. Huh. That was that was a very interesting experience in a crevasse because you know they're really beautiful. Like you walk up to one, and you can you know you just there's these beautiful kind of holes in the ground. But you go down on one, you realize they're pretty scary things. Like you could you know if you get trapped down there, that's not a that's not a good place to be. When I went down halfway, there was also like a kind of like horizontal crevasse that went down. Or like, I mean, kind of sideways through the through the glacier. So you kind of realize that like there's these like holes underneath where you're walking, basically throughout the entire glacier. Like when you're on the top, it looks all flat, but there's like holes and everything underneath. You know, going I guess through the whole thing, or you have no idea really. Yeah. So that's kind of like a weird, scary thing. Most people would see us like walking over bridges over just giant holes in ice that go down hundreds of feet. Maybe not hundreds of feet, but like a hundred feet or I don't know. That's just pretty freaky. It's a pretty insane creation of nature, I guess. We learned a lot about glaciers, like not stuff you could learn in a classroom, like stuff about like what glaciers look like, you know, what what they feel like, you know, what it's like to be inside them because we, we repelled into three different crevasses on three different glaciers. I've learned a lot about glaciers, the landscape they create. Mm -hmm. I think it's so important that people um, start to experience the environment around us because when you live in a city you you get in a routine and you don't remember that there's this huge environment around us that we're actually influencing through our actions so if you if you get out there and you experience it then it's a lot easier for you to care care for the environment if you know what you're caring for If you leave anything and it, it gets snowed over, it'll be part of the glacier for thousands of years at least. So it's, you really have to take care of the mountains.
you know, going from the, the multi-day hikes to the single day hikes was a really nice transition because we got to test out our new light packs and it was so much of an, it was a break, it was a really nice break. Oh. See, no, no more sweat anymore. You sweaty boy? Nah, no, not, for, not anymore. Checking Instagram. Oh really? We were the only people out there because nobody else climbs Bachelor. Is it pretty good? I think maybe they don't have enough supports. No. It only has 18 tie down points. Huh. So that might not be enough. I'm thinking what we need to do is we need to build a giant rock dome over the top of the tent. Or rubber. Rubber? Let's see a firefly. So the highest point we could see from camp was this thing called the Red Banks. There was actually three snow chutes that looked really similar. They were all these really tight chutes at the bottom and then they kind of opened up and went up through the rock. We were worried because those become um, an issue in crowds, especially with rope teams, because um, a lot of the really big accidents on mountains can happen when one, one person from a rope team falls, the entire rope team falls. If a rope team falls into another rope team, they can take the entire other rope team down. Yeah. And so we really didn't want to get caught in this, but somehow was... we passed every single rope team, and then we just went up by ourselves, and it was great. drive was really long. At certain points I was getting very tired. I was like, oh, I had to have Zeo's drive. And then I'm pretty sure as soon as he started driving, I just passed out in the car. We started out on a trail, just like any other trail. And then it eventually went to a moraine, a glacial moraine. And it was a really cool opportunity for us to see a lot of these examples of glacial landscapes because you could so easily see the way the glacier had carved out this yeah. valley and we were walking on the side where the glacier had deposited rock. It, it was just an incredible area. So I'm totally jumping this. <laughs> it's pretty warm though. Feel it for yourself. This stuff, do you think it's so safe to drink? I've been drinking it a lot. Huh?
we yeah. we camped pretty high up, higher than most people. I think 6,900 feet. Yeah, and we had a perfect view of the Deming Glacier, which is just the next one over from the Easton, which is where we went up. I was leading the rope team, and normally that's not that difficult of a job, but for this one, we woke up at 2 a.m. We had the job of basically finding where to go, which was incredibly difficult. It was crazy, because when we went up, it was dark. You know, Logan oh, yeah. was navigating in yeah. just starlight. <laughs> starlight, just starlight. Starlight and headlamp. Then I got tired, and Daniel went to the front, and then all of a sudden, he stops, and there was just a giant crevasse in front of him, probably 20 feet wide. So at this point, I think we hit two or three dead ends, and we're just, we're going right. We're just yeah. keep traversing to the right, hoping to find one snow bridge like, to get across. So basically we're just going right and seeing where we can go up. Eventually, we ended up moving, started to move up again, which yeah, was we found really it. relieving, and we started to think, oh, maybe we will make the summit. <laughs> it's like that feeling when you finally solve a maze, and it's like, yeah. yes, finally. Logan, where is it? Where, where's the summit? Is it which way? I think there were forest fires in the area, but everything was pretty hazy. So it wasn't like your things were blocked, but like the farther you looked away, kind of the more, it was, it was harder to see stuff and it wasn't very clear. The world looked small from up there. Yeah. So when Daniel first told me about this trip, I was really psyched for the idea and I was also really bummed because I had secured a really great internship this summer that I couldn't just give up. So I knew I wouldn't be able to go the entire trip, but I really wanted to ensure that I would get to go on Rainier. Um, I talked to my boss and I made sure that I was going to be able to go on this trip. And for me, this has definitely been the highlight of my summer so far. Are you ready to climb the mountain? Well, we've been climbing mountains for like a month. so. There's no more there's smiles. No, there's left no more. The there, yeah, there's no more smiles. We're just we're really angry now. That's the it. first day, what we did is we just hiked into um, a camp called Glacier Basin. Oh, it's a bear cub right up there. Just saw a little oh. bear cub. We didn't see a big bear, but it's just a cub. And generally, you want to stay away from the cubs because if you get near the cubs, the adult bears think you're trying to harm them, and mm -hmm. that is when they get the most aggressive. Mm -hmm. So we are basically waiting. The hike there took us about an hour, so it was a very tough day. Um, about 1,500 feet of elevation gain. I think we've done 73,000 this trip so far. So it was a pretty relaxing day. Um, it was nice to get back in the mountains uh, and get into that routine that uh, these guys have become so used to. Uh, Eat with it, not rain in yeah, afterwards. Chair, yeah. I had been spending, you know, every 20 minutes at work, you know, just hop on the computer, check out the new uh, weather forecast from National Weather Service. And it was saying that the first two days were supposed to be kind of rainy, showers, you know, we can deal with that. The real question mark was supposed to be the third and fourth day were supposed to be pretty good. And we were going to go for the summit on the third day in the very early morning. And the question was, when would the weather transition? about Camp Sherman from Mount Rainier and uh, we're making dinner right now and I'm cooking 
dicing up a lot of sausage. Very good. Sometimes I, you know, look at it and I think it's a little gross, but then I get really hungry, so. Yeah. <laughs> okay, guys, last one. So starting out on the climb on the summit day, um, for these guys it may be more of a common experience, but for me it was okay, just breathtaking. Awesome. I had never really been on a glacier, uh, never done an alpine ascent at night like this, and you can see the Milky Way above us, you know, reflecting yeah, off um, the glacier. And as we started passing the first crevasses around 10,500, going up the Emmons, you just see these huge lurking masses, and your headlamp would shine down, go as far as it could go, and still you couldn't see the bottom, just into this abyss of nothingness. 13,300 feet. And it was just an amazing feeling of uh, success um, when we, an achievement when we reached the summit. The top of Mount Rainier. We're at the top of Mount Rainier, oh, aka Tahoma. We have uh, approximately uh, 14,411 feet, some say 10. I'm gonna say 11. How does it feel to be done with all of the uphill? It feels great. What's Chris doing? He went all that way that way to pee? As a kid, you kind of can't ignore Mount Rainier, like Baker and Glacier and Adams, it's like you might not know about them, but Rainier is the one you always see. The Rainier is the one that everyone always talks about. And so it's like, it was kind of cool that we like finally climbed the thing that had been in our vision our whole lives growing up. It was, it was pretty incredible. It was also the highest peak of the trip, which is great for the last peak, because the highest peak in the Cascade Mountain Range, which is incredible, highest peak in Washington State. Mm -hmm. It's also incredible. So it was it was a total blast for us. So when you're out for an entire month, just I mean maybe not living in the mountains, but you know being in the mountains, being you know camping, then I think you really get to appreciate it better. We were we were out there for so long that it kind of started to become routine, and then you remember that. Wow, this is this is like a really cool thing we're doing and we're so lucky that we're in an area where we can just come out here and enjoy this beautiful land around us. And I think it's been kind of an eye-opening experience. Something about routine, you mentioned routine. I think it's really funny because we got in a really new routine where Chris yeah. Chris happened which just ended up being the kind of the cook of the trip. He like oh, yeah. all love working with us. So stove. good at making raw. Yeah, so he'd always be working with the stove. You know, I would every night I'd be putting up the tents, setting up. I mean, we'd all be putting up the tents, setting down the tents. And so it was kind of weird because it was a completely different routine. It wasn't like wake up, brush your teeth. It's like, it's like wake up, pack up your sleeping bag, get outside, put on a bunch of clothes because you're probably freezing, and then like packing up a tent. So it's just it's just really weird, but it's it's really great. It's just I got used to it, and now it's gonna be really weird being at home. <laughs>